ਸਾਡੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਹੋਰ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਹੈ ਐਵਰੀਬਾਡੀ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਲਾਈਵ ਲੈਟ ਸਮ ਪੀਪਲ ਗੈਟ ਇਨਟੂ ਦਾ ਚੈਟ ਹੀਅਰ ਔਨ ਫੇਸਬੁੱਕ ਯੂਟਿਊਬ ਟਵਿਚ ਵੇਅਰ ਯੂ ਆਰ ਵਾਚਿੰਗ ਫ੍ਰੋਮ ਥੈਂਕਸ ਫੋਰ ਜੁਆਇਨਿੰਗ ਅਸ ਯੂ ਮਾਈਟ ਰੈਕਗਨਾਈਜ਼ ਮੀ ਮਾਈ ਨੇਮ ਇਜ਼ ਕੈਵਨ ਕੋਰਨੈਲ ਆਈ ਹੋਸਟ ਆਰ ਟੂ ਕੋਰ ਲਾਈਵ ਸੈਸ਼ਨਸ ਐਂਡ ਵੇਰੀਅਸ ਅਦਰ ਥਿੰਗਸ ਇੰਸਟਾਗ੍ਰਾਮ ਲਾਈਵਸ ਬਟ ਆ ਜਸਟ ਵਾਂਟ ਟੂ ਸੇ ਥੈਂਕਸ ਫੋਰ ਜੁਆਇਨਿੰਗ uh you know we're here just taking our first ever um attempt to sort of talk about mental health um i just want to just say hello and just welcome everyone to mental health matters it's our first ever discussion um as you may or may not know here in the US may is mental health awareness month uh and this year we wanted to facilitate a conversation around mental health in the music industry uh whether you're an artist a producer a songwriter whether you're someone who works uh with these folks as a manager or touring professional uh or in other capacities we know it's been a really tough couple of years um so the fact is mental health awareness in the music industry has long been under addressed and underserved uh you know episodic in- income excuse me lack of uh, stability the pressure of being your own brand substance abuse and so many other factors that come into play uh for those looking for a career in the music industry um of course you factor in the pandemic uh it it complicates things even further but even looking at numbers pre-pandemic from a 2018 Princeton study uh 61% of the musician respondents said that they have that their music related income is not sufficient enough to meet living expenses 50% of uh musician respondents reported feeling down depressed or hopeless several days of the week 24% of the respondents reported having a continued or current performance anxiety uh and then even previous to that in the 2016 report showed that of the 2200 musicians surveyed 71% suffered from anxiety 69% suffered from depression and 18% suffered from other forms of mental illness so while paying attention to one's own mental health uh is always important year round to core uh you know we thought it would be a good time to host a discussion with experts uh who I have here with me today uh and cover some of the topics that our community, you know, might relate with and might benefit from. So, again, thanks for joining. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this and, you know, we we're looking forward to hearing your comments. If you have questions, you can feel free to add those in the feed throughout the discussion. But uh today we are live streaming straight from Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm excited to introduce our amazing panelists. I'm going to go down a row and just let everyone sort of introduce themselves and talk about what they do and 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 uh what where we are. All right. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Dr. Amy Mariaska and I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and director of the Nashville OCD and Anxiety Treatment Center in Brentwood, Tennessee. And I'm Chad Carger and I work for Porter's Call here in uh Nashville, Tennessee. Our office is in Franklin. and we provide uh counseling and care to touring artists and their families and have been doing so for 21 years. I'm Mad Wellesley. I am a pop artist here in Nashville. I'm a tunecore artist and I'm just honored to be here talking about this with you guys. And hi, I'm Tatum Alsep, the founder and CEO of Music Health Alliance, and we are also based here in Nashville, but serve the healthcare needs of the music industry nationwide and that includes mental health. So, just again, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um I'm really excited about this lineup. I mean, you know, uh you know, a lot of our webinars were talking about very specific independent musician career stuff and I think this is something that goes so overlooked. So, without further ado, I'm just going to jump into it. Um, you know, mental health awareness, I think especially in the US has become a relatively mainstream concept especially in recent years. Um uh, but as mental health professionals and, and as an artist, just to start things out, how do you think we're doing as a country uh in 2022 as it pertains to just addressing mental health overall? And we we can go right down in a row again. Okay. Well, I think in short better um since the pandemic, I think the pandemic has um really uh, cast a light on the extent to which a lot of people are struggling um the pandemic has also sort of turned up the volume on a lot of struggles that people have had in particular with anxiety and OCD which sure. are my sort of specialties so i would say in short better um but we still have a long way to go i think that there's still um a tremendous amount of stigma and despite the fact that in the musician community and really in the arts community there's a lot of great art and music um that i think is informed by or even about mental health 
um, we're really still at the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think probably just in general, we in the U.S. have a difficult time managing healthcare, just you know, at large, and and I think specifically you can really see it inside the mental health, you know, sector. And for me, I feel like that we are better when we just consider our mental health as a part of our whole health, you know? Mm -hmm. So treating it holistically really helps to um, address the needs. And I feel like we're moving more in that direction. Some really great, you know, work that's being done in all the fields related to the medical uh, field. It just seems to really promote the idea that that it's this, we're really treating the whole person, not some stigmatized part of a person. Um, and I, I would agree with what Amy's saying too, with uh, the co- with COVID, it's just really turned up the volume on the need, you know, yeah. people are confronting that, you know, realistically, so. Yeah, I think definitely with COVID, everybody kind of, although we are all separate, mm-hmm. we all came together mm-hmm. and like bonded on our, issues that we were experiencing mentally during that time. Mm -hmm. I know that that was, I've always been as an artist open about my mental health struggles and the holistic approaches that I take, but I definitely think that we talked about it more, or at least among my artist friends and my family and my friends that aren't in the artist world, I was definitely more open about it and they were too. But with that being said, coming out of it, it's difficult to find the help that we need because of where our country is at with healthcare. Mm -hmm. When I find a therapist that I want to work with, they often don't accept the health insurance Mm -hmm. or most people's health insurance won't even provide um, anything for mental health. So we have a long ways to go for sure. Well, I'm going to tag off what you said. I think it's awesome. And the fact that we're sitting here having a panel on mental health is fantastic. And that's a huge start in destigmatizing what we're doing. When it comes to health care in the U.S., um, the Affordable Care Act provides some basic necessities that have to be covered by your health insurance. And one of those things is supposed to be mental health, including inpatient, outpatient, and counseling. However, the reimbursement rate with those health insurance plans, the best of the best is tiny. And most of the best therapists can't afford to accept Mm -hmm. health insurance because they would be paid pennies on the dollar and they can't afford to keep their practices open. Mm -hmm. So what we found is some of our best practitioners don't accept health insurance, which then creates, when you have an industry where there's episodic income, you get a fluctuation of, well, maybe I can afford counseling this week, maybe not, Mm -hmm. or it's just hard to find someone, especially if you're from a marginalized community and you want somebody who understands your specific demographic. So I'm so happy that we're here talking about it. Because it's a start, and that's mm-hmm. what we need to do more of. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the artists uh, or industry professionals watching um, who maybe didn't know about some of the organizations y'all represent um, are thankful to know that those are available. Um, but clearly the running theme is we've got a long way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I want to tap a little bit more specifically into um, being a creator, you know, being an artist, uh, just because we, we know that's not the average job. Uh, but speaking more specifically to the realm of music and art, and Tatum, I can stay with you on this one. You know, what kind of common but unique challenges or just sort of ongoing tolls uh, present themselves that can negatively impact creators' uh, mental health, you know, COVID or none? Well, we're in the creative world. Most of the time, we've got one side of the brain firing at a bazillion miles per hour, and the other side's over here going, eh, well, maybe I'll wake up. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that in itself means we operate in our industry a lot of times in crisis management mode. So we um, don't have a game plan in place when there is a crisis. And if there's a takeaway from this, I really hope that it will be, okay, I can, maybe I can step away and build a, a prevention plan, a game plan, maybe find that counselor and some resources to help pay for it because they exist. Um, I think that's something that we see over and over again is 
the constant need for crisis management instead of prevention. Sure. And that's mm-hmm. been exacerbated through mm-hmm. the pandemic. I could go on and on, but I'm sure <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I guess just speaking more to like just uh, the, the, the common challenges that an artist face mad, like are there things that sort of come to mind to you as uh, that – folks are just not experiencing on the job that they are oh, yeah. not really inclined <laughs> to think about. Absolutely. I mean, I think the biggest thing as an artist or as a musician is constantly putting your entire heart and soul into the intangible product sure. that you're putting out into the world. Or if you're an artist, a physical product, but you're you're making yourself vulnerable to other people's opinions on something that you pride yourself on and then you kind of have to wait and see if other people deem it good or bad and that is so taxing on the mental side of everything because it's like you can believe in it so much but if people tell you that it's bad you're gonna end up believing them or you're like hoping that they're gonna say that it's good and you just that then becomes you Yeah. Like you are that product and they're saying you're good or you're bad. Mm -hmm. And you really have to. And I'm I work on it every day. um, But separate myself from the art that I'm putting out. Once it's out there, I can no longer say this is me. Like this is all of me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Chad, is the the validation cycle that that uh, Mad talks about something you, you see a lot? Yeah, I was just thinking as you were saying that, like I first of all, I'm always in awe of how hard it is to be an artist in terms of making a living, paying your bills, and enjoying what you're doing. That like just that minimal activity yeah. is so incredibly difficult. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've worked with professionals in other sectors of, you know, our country and just the intangibility of what success is. Like, how do you know when you've reached that point? How do you know that I'm doing what it is that I feel passionate about doing? Just that being so abstracted makes it so incredibly difficult. (laughs) So the feedback loop in there can get really vicious. And I mean, honestly, a lot of the time I spend with artists is just helping them just do some reality-based thinking around what they're doing, what they're achieving, who they are, kind of separating things out, seeing them in an organized fashion and not just being a huge blur. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. And, And as we talk about this, like we are, you know, kind of going back to the theme that it's not your average job, right? So... Um, but we also know that like folks who do choose to pursue a career in music, they just, as Matt was saying, have different ideals around self-fulfillment that other professionals simply don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Amy, I wanted to ask you, how do you feel that that, the weight, uh, you know, toward that impacts the way artists maybe react to rejection or seeming Mm -hmm. lack of worth as they're putting music out or as they're hitting the road? Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, I think you touched on this, which is the idea that you can begin to consider your art as the marker of your Mm self-worth, right? Or um, it's it's one thing to have higher standards, and we do know that with creatives, there tend to be higher levels of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. Not surprisingly, I think, to anyone in this world. Um, And and perfectionism itself is not a bad thing. Perfectionism can be wonderful. It can be about I have high standards, and so I strive to meet these high standards. It's really when perfectionism then becomes your only... um, your only source of worth is how well something is received, um, which again is subjective. I think there are so many different ways now of um, assessing for whether or not something does well, and especially with like social media, the internet, and it's like, well, I got a kajillion likes on this or, <laughs> yeah. or listens, and yet that's not necessarily converting to um, something that's sustainable financially so having those multiple streams of like you said feeling like okay well my product is my worth Mm -hmm. right that's where it gets a little bit tricky Um, and given that it's something that is so um you know it comes from the heart it's coming from you it's a little bit different than um you know not to knock anybody who's i guess like i don't know um laying concrete or something but you know that's probably not Mm going to have the same amount of like if that's a little bit off that's going to feel less personally wounding Mm -hmm. than art you talked about kind of it's like quantifiable um 
worth. Yeah. 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 I don't know if that's, I mean, maybe I, it's not like the most eloquent way of putting that, but you, you know, it's uh, social media has just become such an important part of everyone's life, but mm-hmm. specifically artists just getting their work out there. Chad, is that, you know, uh, when we talk about rejection and we're talking about that mm-hmm. seeming lack of worth, something that you are finding yeah, yourself I think coming across a lot? I, I feel like being an artist and committing yourself to it, you're almost setting yourself up to, you're kind of begging the question of how do you know who you are? How do you evaluate worth? What is your purpose? I was just meeting with an artist this morning and, you know, asked him the most obvious question in the midst of his struggle, like, why do you do this? And I said to him, like, th- that's a real question in this room. I'm really asking you that question. We're going to explore that. Mm-hmm. I know outside this room, it's kind of colloquial or just in casual conversation. Why would you do this? But in here, I really want to explore that question because that really gets at the heart of sustainability, yeah. creativity. How do you know if you're being successful? Who am I? You know, that's so it kind of begs the question of those things and those sort of substructures that a person has in their life so as to be able to answer some of these questions, you know. Well, your why also gives you your North Star. Yeah. So when you're, if you can have like a single sentence that you mm-hmm. can just kind of come back to as an affirmation when things are getting really difficult, you just sit down and you say why you're doing this mm-hmm. to yourself and it kind of lets you recenter. So that's a great way of saying it. I mean, I think I spent years not really having my mm-hmm. why. Yeah. And then I figured it out and now it it really does make mm-hmm. the approach a lot easier yeah. to what we're doing. Yeah, that's well said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I mean and you know, what you guys are talking about could totally um be applied to other uh walks of life or yes. other industries mm-hmm. but um i don't know i think just as a people we're not really trained to to to, to position our brain like they're to tap into our own thinking and mm-hmm. how our thinking affects our emotions and how like this could be an endless <laughs> cycle to some degree <laughs> um and i think everyone you know sort of goes through that in their life uh to some degree so i think those are super thoughtful answers before we go to the next one i don't want to leave tatum out of that one if you had any well i, d- I have one more thing to add and it has to do with resiliency i mean constantly when you start early in your career building a resilience so you don't become a slave to your social media so Mm -hmm. you do have a healthy balance and um if you can learn that early in your career Mm -hmm. it's almost like you hear all the time when it comes to a mammogram well prevention is secure well it's the same thing with your brain Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and building that resilience Mm -hmm. internally instead of it coming externally all Mm -hmm. the time yeah and i think as a culture too we just haven't figured out ways to do that that don't feel like i guess the expression is like woo woo you know and it's just like (laughs) you know you don't need a woo woo doctor (laughs) (laughs) it's you know but it's even just like everyday life for a lot of people they could use that that Mm -hmm. 10 minutes to just kind of breathe a little bit and think about it. I mean, do you have any advice for building that resilience? Because that's something I'm constantly looking exactly to build. exactly yeah. what you're talking about. I mean, you have started really looking, I mean, you're separating your art from who you are internally. It is a huge part of who you are, but every fabric of your being does not hinge on mm-hmm. how many likes you get mm-hmm. or whether or not the record label accepts your product or if you're a session player or even a, a label executive i mean they're all there's all this external pressure because you're dealing with fame and fortune and um that's not sustainable in any walk mm-hmm. of life you know yeah. so i think that yeah. prevention piece these two i mean these amazing people who have the scientific knowledge getting them in your toolbox is yeah. so mm-hmm. important mm-hmm. you know yeah um shifting gears but not really and this is a question i i, I say this because it you know we talked about how everything we just sort of said can easily be applied to all walks of life but when we talk about the inevitable discussion on the pandemic here um and and that did you know i'm not i'm not being cheeky that is an important part of why we wanted to have this conversation because two years of you know isolation and mm-hmm. instability uh, rocked a lot of worlds um, so in 2020 we obviously saw the world shut down um, aside from the illness itself you know obviously uh, covid posed a threat to a lot of artists income a lot of financial stability um, the opportunity to collaborate and be on the road these really important mm-hmm. things uh, and then you know like I said set in motion a long-term isolation from others which 
I'm sure some people maybe thrived and wrote a lot of songs and, and discovered a lot of about their career, but uh, it's not for everyone. And in that first year, Amy, I wanted to come back to you on this one. Uh, in that first year, what kind of previously undiagnosed conditions uh, did you see commonly surfacing, you know, maybe in a severe way, maybe less so, but people will recognize it, uh, just among artists and members of the music industry in, in your line of work? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Mm-hmm. I think that we saw, as you were mentioning, um, when the pandemic hit, there was isolation. So we saw upticks in depressive symptoms, yeah. um, upticks in... Um, Yeah, and people having a hard time accessing their why, Mm -hmm. right? Because maybe their why is something that they engage with or rather their values, the valued life they want to live is something that they don't have Mm -hmm. in their living room, you Mm -hmm. know, um, with their, they want to go out, they want to do things like that. So we did see an increase in depression. Interestingly, um, we didn't see an uptick in in sort of OCD symptoms. And I mentioned that given that that's one of my my, um, specialty areas. But what we did see is that people with, OCD were kind of, um, including artists with OCD, were kind of like feeling like, ah, at least now the world kind of understands me more. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people with social anxiety felt kind of great at the beginning, (laughs) right? (laughs) (laughs) Because, you know, hey, this is like, this uh, this will do. I don't have to face this. But what we're seeing now is things are opening up. And as they've been opening up, as I've been calling it, it's sort of like, the, the second wave, or four, I don't know how many waves we're on, but it's like the mental health wave yeah. of um, anxiety that's coming out now. People coming and re-engaging, trying to get gigs, trying to um, just being out in public, playing, um, doing more sort of promotion in person, that kind of thing. We're seeing that those folks are really struggling because yeah. anxiety lives and sort of breeds in areas of avoidance. Mm-hmm. So they sort of had like, socially sanctioned avoidance and now that they're coming back we're seeing a lot of people with social anxiety struggling and supporting them through that mm-hmm. yeah i mean i the the re-entry to me mm-hmm. has been as tricky mm-hmm. as the shutdown i think i had a lot of artists honestly in the initial phases where they kind of figured out their finances right there and everything just calmed down where they were like oh this is amazing mm-hmm. and 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 then of course as it wore on it became more anxiety inducing sure and now everyone's going out at the same time Mm -hmm. and it's like everyone lined up at the starting line at the same Mm -hmm. time they fired off the same gun and everyone took off and there's a whole sort of web of complexities in that space and uh you know that's i it's kind of this unique space you know we've never none of us have ever been through this yeah so Mm -hmm. we're all kind of learning together you know how to manage such a strange moment yeah your starting line comment is really interesting i haven't really thought about it that way but even you know as a non-artist myself just i live in queens you know i hang out in brooklyn these are tight (laughs) rooms i like loud music i like poorly produced shows (laughs) (laughs) i like you know i love all that stuff and it's you know uh it's it's been a lot to grapple with you know so Mm -hmm. when you think about just the competition and you know maybe competition's not the right word but that competitive mentality of being like no i'm i'm gonna hit the road this is happening now i'm getting ahead of this Mm -hmm. um and uh, i'm sure a lot of built up you know um just desire to to get out there and perform and create again Um, i think that's one of the things i saw is like the in the creative process you forget that the performance is such an important part of the whole cycle mm-hmm. and so we just took that away for two yeah. years mm-hmm. so yeah. you're in this like everybody's rusty of, yeah it's like yeah. this sort of muted feedback like i don't mm-hmm. how does this play out yeah. and so there was like kind of a you know definitely a hiccup in the process and as that wore on it, it took its toll well it's interesting because pre-pandemic i never had performance anxiety mm-hmm. i mean maybe here and there but it was enough to get me excited and not want to crawl into a hole mm-hmm. and not see a single person mm-hmm. and coming out of it starting to perform again i am experiencing anxiety performance anxiety specifically in ways i had never had before and it's just because we're all out of practice mm-hmm. and we're out of practice of dealing with those nerves in a healthy manner. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really interesting to me because I'm realizing I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. 
I think everybody is having to relearn that and relearn social skills and going to networking events and having to talk about yourself and meet new people. It's just, it's so overwhelming after I personally thrived when I didn't have to have multiple jobs and I was able to sit and just do my art for hours on end and not have to really think about anything else or please anybody else. Um, I had a great time. <laughs> um, but now coming out of it, it's bringing a lot of my social anxiety and performance anxiety back. And it's not, it's every level of artist. I mean, Celine Dion's talking about it now. Adele's talking about it now. And it's their whole team. It's the band and the crew and the tour manager and the artist manager and the agents. Everyone has this anxiety mm -hmm. as a whole of the starting line and getting rolling because it all went away overnight. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. were the first industry to shut down and we have been the last to True. get back. Mm -hmm. And everyone had to figure out how to eat and make money and get so scrappy that you know it's that is a very normal visceral reaction yeah. and just to know that it's okay and you're not alone in all this mm -hmm. and as you know these teams go out um the bands and the crews it's okay to bring in a therapist to sit and talk with everybody mm -hmm. that's a great idea actually yeah. <laughs> you know it's not just wasn't my talent. idea <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are doing yeah it's yeah. not just for Coachella or Bonnaroo either yeah. it's this is um this is very real and no one is alone in this at all well it's also really amazing to see the bigger artists coming out and talking about it like I know that I don't know when it was but it was somewhat recently Jojo which I grew up listening mm, and course. loving mm. Jojo my for the majority of my childhood she came out and started talking about how her performance anxiety can be crippling sometimes yeah. mm -hmm. and hearing an, a professional artist talk about that in such an open way is very comforting to know that even at that level somebody else is still experiencing that and it's not just I mean it is me. like humanly speaking it's a it's somewhat of a huge challenge to put yourself on a stage you know in a live setting, thousands oh, yeah. of people out there in social media, fame, all that's really challenging to our, our core humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it only makes mm -hmm. sense that it would be somewhat anxiety producing yeah. because it kind of asks the big Getting questions. Yeah. It. yeah, it's not necessarily the healthiest place to live your <laughs> oh, life. Oh, no, you know? not, not at all. <laughs> Once again, so, why yeah, are we doing exactly. this? I... <laughs> exactly. But actually, I, whether Tatum meant to or not, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pretend that she did. But you <laughs> kind of started to go into the next question like perfectly because I wanted to stay on this topic. Um, so much of why we're having this conversation, why we're doing this panel right now, is that it's just never too late to express to artists or anyone, you know, in the industry, outside of the industry, that it's exactly as you said, it's normal to feel this way. It's normal to be going through this. Um, you talked a little bit about artists bringing on or working with a professional. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask everyone else as we enter this new era, and if you have any other additions, please, as we enter this new era, what advice do you have for artists or industry folks who may have chosen, chosen excuse me, during all of this to just weather the storm, uh, you know, or but maybe have a, a lingering impact of this in their lives? Um, you know, I, again, I think the, the well, professional one was great. The um we're also taught in our industry, never let them see you sweat, minimize your weaknesses. It is not okay to admit that you may be having some sort of anxiety. Well, it, it is. And the healthiest artists in our industry are the ones who do take care of themselves. And it doesn't just mean from your ears down. Mm -hmm. I mean, your brain is part of this. As Chad said, this is your we're looking at the whole body and if you're not taking care of your control center, nothing else is gonna work properly. So um, there are lots of places to go and I know we'll get to that where you can talk to people confidentially. No one ever has to know. You can still minimize your weaknesses, but if you're gonna be successful for the long term in this business, it's not sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It is mental health, physical yeah. health, sleep, mm -hmm. nutrition. Yeah. You know. Uh, it, it, so yeah, just kind of going down the line, if there's any advi advice that you have for, again, like specifically folks who I think 
got through this kind of best case scenario where they they weathered the storm but like maybe internally it's still lingering a little mm, bit yeah i think my biggest takeaway from everything was that although it sounds counterproductive taking breaks mm. when you need to can be the most productive sure. most beneficial thing you can do for yourself and that's i have to remind myself that because now that everything has come back so fast I am struggling to keep up with everything and I have to say okay you don't need to say yes to everything you are burning yourself out you need to take a break and that's fine sure. take a day off don't get on social media for a day like meditate go to a workout class all these things that I'm just I don't know it sounds very simple but it makes the biggest difference if you can just allow yourself to breathe yeah i agree with that like um you know the thing i will say to artists a lot of times is there's more things that you can't control than you can but you can always respond you know yeah. so wherever you're losing feel like you don't have control or have lost control you still have this core ability to respond and at a really simple level, on a physical, mental level, you can respond with like simple breathing exercises, connecting with a good friend, you know, going for a walk, doing exercise. You know, these things are just so simple and they're a way to respond. They don't control or make anything go away or whatever, but it's, it's a good way to be a human being, to kind of live in this more simplified space because again, the world is very complex for uh, the average artist. <coughs> to me, it's just like coming back to that holistic, <coughs> you know, of the care is, is just so critical. Mm -hmm. The body is such an important part of this. Yeah. It's, we're, so, we're, we're always in danger of separating out this mental thing out here and treating it separate from the body. But what we know is, is um, Amy can attest to especially, is <coughs> how important the physical health is to mm -hmm. the mental health. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's definitely a feedback loop there, and, and and even so much so that we don't know where one ends and the other begins, right? Mm -hmm. We have great research kind of showing that. Um, I mean, I, I feel like in ten years we're gonna we're gonna know that like our gut microbiome is actually, you know, yeah. responsible for a right. lot of things that are happening. <laughs> yeah, tons of studies, right? Yeah. <laughs> I would say also um, super important to um, practice self compassion. So self-compassion, yeah. this idea of reminding yourself, okay, I'm human and there's no reason why I should, um, you know, why I need to be perfect or flawless or any of these other things. We know anxiety has evolved as an adaptive mechanism. If we didn't have anxiety, we wouldn't fare very well <laughs> um, in the past. We need it to kind of motivate our behavior. And when you have excessive anxiety, that's merely just you know just you're you're um you're not calibrated correctly. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you're calibrated. That is such a good word <laughs> for <our> industry. <laughs> yeah. 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 Calibrated. <laughs> and common um sorry self compassion has um three components. Uh, one of which is common humanity. So this mm -hmm. idea that hearing you say, oh well, I didn't know that I'm not alone. Yeah. I think that part is. Yeah you know, can't be stressed enough that this is a common human experience where um, we might all be walking around thinking, well, I'm the only one up here who's anxious right yeah. now. And everybody else has the same thought bubble. Um, so I would say that. And then talking about it, you know, if you're not ready to talk to a therapist, that's okay. Are you ready to talk to a friend, a family member, uh, a person online, things like that? There's a lot of mental health social media that can be helpful. Um, the more we talk about things, the harder it is for the shame to kind of stay there. Yeah, it's good. I've it's always good. found that the second that I start talking about it, mm -hmm. I instantly start feeling better. Yeah. It's yeah. like I, I don't know, it's like I went to a month-long therapy session mm -hmm. Well, once I start the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's like you're, gain, you're, you're gaining the agency again by yeah. using mm -hmm. words and ideas and mm -hmm. organizing your thoughts. All of a sudden you feel like you're back at the helm. You're in control again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So much of what you know that was those were really great answers and so much of it came down to um resources and routines that mm -hmm. are like readily available to us <laughs> that i think um whether it's just the distractions we have in front of us or just human nature we just haven't gotten there yet we don't think about it and you know um 
for instance, I'm not like a physical fitness freak, but I've always found that like just going on a jog or mm -hmm. moving some stuff around if you're in a bad mood goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Mental, you know, also just sort of mental exercise, breathing, stuff like that. I mean, mm -hmm. this stuff is all readily mm -hmm. available to us. And um, and those are just really strong answers. Um, I also at this point want to say if, uh, we're getting a lot of great comments um, coming in across the social channels. So thank you. A lot of support. If you guys have any questions, uh, obviously no pressure, but feel free to drop them in there. Um, you know, we got some really wonderful, smart people here uh, with a lot of experience. So just wanted to say that. I'll keep it going here, though. Um, Amy, I had this one for you to, just to jump off with. You know, as a brand, you know, TuneCore, we serve artists, we serve managers, we serve, you know, labels across, you know, all different genres, all different career levels. We know, even just working in distribution, <laughs> that a uh, one-size-fits-all solution just is mm -hmm. not a thing in music. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing that pressure, specifically in all of its forms, can lead to anxiety, can lead to stress, it can lead to depression. Are there any general steps, not to you know, debase it here, general steps that people in music can take to just acknowledge and begin to cope with the pressure that is associated mm -hmm. with, uh, the, with their careers and in their daily lives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this is going to synthesize some of the things that we've talked about thus far, but um, this is this is from um, a type of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy. But um, acceptance and commitment therapy talks about how there's always this this um, tension between kind of like the desire to change things that are uncomfortable, and um, and then the necessary acceptance of the things that we can't change, which as Chad pointed out is a whole lot, right? So we have that kind of dialectic between acceptance, change, acceptance, change. Um, when thinking about pressures. Um, I like to talk about things as, are they kind of a, we call them like a toward move or an away move. And a toward move means, are you moving toward those things that are your North Star, your values, your goals, um, connection, love, creativity, adventure, whatever that is for an individual. Taking a step back when you're feeling like you're um, under pressure or you feel obligated to do something and asking, am I doing this as a means to move toward those things that are important to me? Or am I doing this as a means to avoid mm -hmm. potential rejection, to avoid yeah. falling behind in the rat race, to avoid you know, looking um, human, frankly, mm -hmm. to others, right? So showing imperfection. Um, so I know that's a little bit of an oblique answer to that question, but that's what comes to mind. No, I mean, that would that was great. I mean, yeah. if anyone has any additional thoughts, again, just the topic being general steps, even baby steps. Yeah. So wait, what if you are moving towards the negative? How do you recalibrate to get yeah. yourself back yeah. into the positive reinforcement? No, that is a great question. So if you find that you are doing something in the service of reducing like a negative um, reducing discomfort so like I'm doing this out of fear right fear mm -hmm. is is always an away move fear is I want to turn and run away if you find yourself doing that I would say number one don't beat yourself up mm -hmm. you're human this is natural we're mm -hmm. all doing that there's a lot of anxiety so sort of awareness self-compassion and then um and then giving yourself permission to say um I, I don't have to do it all I don't have to do it all I'm going to practice I always give people homework to practice saying no I think that is something that can help preserve mm -hmm. some You're of the, big. yeah, which is hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very hard. I'm looking at you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I think part of it is knowing that. And then it is, it's sort of, I, I'll get very physical with my clients. I'll be like, all right, we're yeah. pivoting. You yeah. know, we're pivoting. And it's going to be painful because that means you are going to take that anxiety with you. You're no longer running away from it. Mm -hmm. I wish I could just climb in your front pockets and ride around <laughs> for the day and just fill up my brain with all this amazing knowledge. I, know. I mean, to um, me, it's amazing. like I think some of the things I tell artists, I, I usually always have them while I'm working with them, keeping a gratitude journal. So like the last thing you do before you go to bed or turn off your lights is just write down a few things from that day that were beautiful, that really energized you, that you were just grateful to be able to see, experience, taste, smell, hear, whatever. Um, I always have them doing some sort of early, you know, morning meditation before they mm -hmm. walk out the door and really start their day. And then I always prescribe physical exercise to whatever degree that they're able to or wherever they're at on that. 
And I just tell them, like, look, there's not many things that I can guarantee you will add positive change in your life. But those three things, if you do them more times in the given month or days in the given month than not, are going to provide measurable differences. I mean, at the end of 30 days, you will see differences yeah. in your life on the level that then you create the big changes, you know. But you have to start with these little incremental steps that yeah. are sometimes hard to get down. And not to go down, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but meditation's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard to sit there for two minutes mm-hmm. not well, thinking about exactly. anything. Exactly. And I, this is where our phones can be. Our vices, I try to turn them into our devices, you know, our tools. <laughs> yeah, that's and what I wanted to ask. Yeah, if so you have it's any like for me, steps. like I, you know, I tell people to just download the Headspace sure. app. Mm-hmm. It's a very simple five to ten minute exercise. You can pick your voice, you know, the person's going to guide you. Um, and, you know, again, he, you can build up to bigger exercises, mm-hmm. but... You know, smaller ones, uh, you can you can do five, ten minutes. I tell people, too, like on the gratitude journal, take a picture of something that you're grateful for, mm-hmm. upload it into a note you know, mm-hmm. on your phone, and just type out why you took that picture. Again, just this mindfulness. Like I'm moving through life with purpose yeah. on a really simple, basic level. You yeah. Know? yeah, I'm definitely working on being more intentional mm-hmm. with life right now. And going off of what you said with – like just showing thanks for everything when I am realizing that I'm very overwhelmed with things that are coming at me I try to do my best to kind of like switch the dialogue so Mm -hmm. like instead of getting overwhelmed by an opportunity I try to express gratitude for it and like thank you so much for this opportunity that's come into my life like I am confident that the universe or God or whatever you all believe in will provide me the tools to get through this and I definitely try to shift that to shift my mind and I will say like a list of things that I'm grateful for over and over in my head until I feel that tension in my chest just subside a little bit um that definitely helps and then with headspace you mentioned jogging and we're talking about physical um help the nike run club yeah. for runners there is a headspace portion of it so mm-hmm. you can be on a run and the i don't remember his name andy yeah of headspace yeah. um will give you these meditations to think about while you're <laughs> running really it's great? so yeah. good really it's so cool. good so if you can't sit down and yeah. be still mm-hmm. That's a really good option. And I just at this point want to say Headspace is not yeah. a sponsor. <laughs> but they should be. <laughs> they should be. They're really great. And are you watching out there, Andy? <laughs> uh, no, those are really great answers. I had to ask just because I just know it's 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 very difficult. It takes years to, to, to really build that up. And um, those are really accessible, solid answers. And Chad, I kind of wanted to ask you just the nature of uh, w- what you do day to day. Um, something that can be largely over, like overlooked, excuse me, when discussing, especially the last two years we've had, is the impact that it's had on artists, uh, artists, touring professionals, uh, their families. Oh yeah, um, it's huge. It's a, a hugely important relationships, obviously, that should be and can be a source of strength uh, and support. They're just not exempt from friction. We know that. So, can you share your thoughts on? And I'll ask everyone, obviously, just leading with with Chad. Just share your thoughts on the role. That partners or spouses uh, uh, play during the pan- during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean at Porter's Call we see the artists um, themselves and their partner, so the eligibility falls for both of those people for us. And uh, one of the things I, I will say that was you know partly humorous in the pandemic was a lot of these relationships started when people were touring hundred. 150 days a year now all of a sudden everybody's at home together (laughs) and they're like we didn't start this relationship thinking that we're going to spend every single waking hour together right and uh, that presented a whole host of challenges but this is definitely to me one of the you know forgotten people in the industry is the spouse or partner to a recording artist and there's a whole host of challenges that falls upon them directly um, as a result of that but one of the things that I'm always, and especially as people re-enter now, is creating routines when they're out on the road, especially toward the end of a tour or the end of a run, 
that will help them transition home, back to home seamlessly. So if, you, if you're going to go home Sunday morning and you're completely hung over from Saturday night, you know, that's going to make that transition more difficult. Yeah. And so if you know that you've got this buffer zone of a flight or a passage of time on a bus or something, almost begin to live like you're already at home you know, that mm. Sunday while you're transitioning mm. or that Monday or whatever the day might be. And to do that is to really just be mindful and thoughtful for your partner who's waiting on you at home because their life has been thrown off kilter when you walk through the door yeah. in a way that's not mindful of them. You know, sure. So I'm always kind of trying to, you know, create space from their angle, from that spouse or that partner's angle um, that encourages healthy reconnect and then separate and again because of the pandemic everybody kind of got out of practice with that mm -hmm. now everybody's going out again yeah and so i'm just sort of reiterating some of those things for folks yeah <clears throat> yeah i mean does anyone else have any kind of thoughts or comments on just uh how how family members and specifically partners and spouses i think that is a, a good place to focus just because mm -hmm. i just want to so at music health alliance we provide um mental health grants for anyone who's made a living in the music industry for at least three years. And that also includes your spouse and dependents. Wow. So um, while clinically that is not our area of expertise, we help provide solutions and resources, but we understand so acutely how families are impacted um, by this creative um, world that we live in. So there are resources available hopefully cost is never going to be an issue for right. a reason you don't seek counseling i want to echo that too we have i was telling amy before we started we have grants from at porter's call mm -hmm. from specific genres of music industry so country americana you know we have grants from gospel music foundations and other such organizations so cost is never a reason not to get help for either you or your mm -hmm. partner or spouse is hugely important. Uh, yeah, and it's important to remember here too, like we're here in Nashville, um, obviously a major music market. Um, I'm up in New York, major music market. Um, all of this stuff we've talked about today is universally applicable. Um, and yeah, maybe there might be a few less resources in your backyard, so it might seem. Um, I do hope this sort of inspires people to start looking a little further. I know, I mean, you just sort of start to scratch the surface of uh, nonprofits, uh, grants, that sort of thing that are aimed at keeping musicians healthy, uh, creating. Um, and I think that's another, it's a, it maybe a cause and effect of just sort of where our, our economy has gone and education and all of that uh, into where it's like, do, do I have to be a mid-level graphic designer to be in a band? You know what I mean? Like, how, do, how am I going to pay rent? Uh, and <laughs> And you see a lot of that in New York because it's so expensive, um, and it's. It, I, I wonder about the sustainability of it all. So I just wanted to. We should say too, like Music Cares, the Grammys Association, mm -hmm. Philanthropic Arm is mm -hmm. a huge player in this space, and and I know this is true for you guys, but we serve people on both coasts in Nashville. So those resources too are applicable to people who don't just live in Nashville, yeah, yeah to mm -hmm. make that clear. Yeah, Music Care is a fantastic organization and um, strongly recommend everyone checks that out. Um, the, the last question I had set up is, is really more of just kind of like a takeaway, but we've talked so much and I know we've really like hammered on a few points, but I'll still, you know, just want to acknowledge obviously that mental health awareness in music is not more important than it was before COVID. Uh, as Amy started us off, it's just the volume has been turned up and, mm -hmm. um, you know, not patting ourselves on the back, but conversations like this tend to help, um, you know, facilitate further discussion and, f and further reflection. And I, I hope we're able to do that. But whether we're talking about the resources, the routines, acceptance, uh, or just ongoing strategies for coping and addressing personal mental health and well-being, um, I just kind of wanted to go just down the line and, and, and just sort of say what are our takeaways for viewers in terms of moving forward in this new era. I know we might repeat ourselves a little bit, but if there's anything we wanted to just jump into, and I'll start with you, Amy. Yeah, well, starting with, and I'll, I'll like do the thing where I directly look at people. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's really important you're, you're not alone. Number one, you're not alone. Um, I hope that's been abundantly clear. And that, um, that there are good, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm likely to say, you know, there are good treatments available because that's kind of my, my background and that's true. And there are also, if that's something that's inaccessible to you, um, there are a lot of resources out there to, um, I would suggest, you know, talking to people, connecting with like-minded people. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, mental health, social media. There's a lot out there and a lot of it is great. If you look for uh, mental health social media accounts that are by licensed therapists, you're more likely to get information that really gets into the nuances of, um, of mental health care and, um, and, and looking as well at you know mental health accounts for creatives and things like that. Um, so that would be, and, and you know, in abundant self-compassion, you know, you're not alone and, um, and you're human, you're allowed to be human which means you are allowed to ask for help as well, which I think is really hard to do. Yeah, I would say my first thing is thank you for being who you are as an artist. The world needs music. I mean, for me, I'm a huge music fan, so it's such an honor to be able to sit in rooms and spaces with artists like yourself and help remove the obstacles out of your way so that you can do what it is that you want and need to do and that the world wants and needs for you to do and take that seriously um in the sense of like your body your mind your health should be addressed as consistently and as often as you pay attention to your craft and your vocation um make that a priority and find people who can help you do that so um, my biggest takeaway is let's keep the conversation going. Um, going back, a big part of my why is connecting with people and music gives me that opportunity. So for me to help keep the conversation going, if you guys find me on Instagram or Facebook and want to send a message, I am here to talk about anything and everything. And I definitely want to just be here for everybody and to encourage you to ask for help because there are so many people out there that are willing to help you than you realize. Echoing, you are just not alone. I mean, you can call Porter's Call, you can call Music Health Alliance, you can call Music Cares, you can look us up online. You do not have to wait for a crisis to reach out. Let us help you build your safety net and prevention mechanism so when things do get dark, and in our industry, with our creative brains, they do. It's the nature of the beast. It goes back to Shakespeare and Da Vinci, you know? It's just the way we are made up, and that is also what brings such beauty and the brilliance of music that heals that we all know so let us help heal the music and please reach out it's always confidential and you're just not alone yeah. great these are um, amazing takeaways obviously and some added uh, wisdom from what we've been talking about today at this point I know I mentioned it earlier you know if you have any questions drop in the chat um, I'm gonna be honest you know we get a very engaged crowd uh, for our, our panels and for our webinars and um, I know these are difficult questions to ask, so I didn't really show up prepared to have a lot of questions from folks, but we did get one and I wanted to address this from Jacqueline from Facebook. Jacqueline asks, uh, can you speak to the modern, uh, sorry, the modern, can you speak to how the mandates uh, specifically have affected or restricted just the amount of opportunities and participation in regards to shows and touring? Obviously, we all know that has been a major thing. Mm -hmm. um, and just how artists can manage uh, their career and their mental health challenges around sort of that unknowing. I, Jacqueline, I think if that's what you're asking, sort of the unknowing, if like, mm. well, is this tour going to get me as far as Missouri or is everybody going to shut down again? Mm. I mean, the, one of the most important general principles around mental health is the ability to be flexible in your thinking mm -hmm. and sort of the maneuverability of yourself in space and time and, you know, rigidity as its opposite doesn't really ever serve us really well as human beings right but especially right now so i would just encourage you jacqueline to just go forth with kind of open hands you know like mm -hmm. the world is slowly perhaps maybe opening back up right. um but it's just that's such an important just overall character trait but specifically right now you know yeah I do know live stream concerts are still happening and there are like 
opportunities to get tipped and paid through those shows. So definitely don't ignore those true. just yet. Yeah, I, I'd be remiss to, to, yeah. to say we also are in uh, Toon Den Studios here yeah. in Nashville. Yeah. Toon Den run by the two Ryans who... Um, they didn't ask me to say this. I'm just, I want to call them out because, <laughs> you know, two professional musicians uh, who saw what was happening and saw the opportunity to give artists, uh, like-minded folks, mm -hmm. the opportunity to broadcast live uh, in a very professional setting here. Um, and they've been crushing it. And it's just another example of exactly what Mad said there. Mm -hmm. um, where I know we've, we've talked about it ad nauseum just with the, with the live streams and the tipping and everything for the past two years. But guess what? People want to give you money. I can't tell you how much money I spent on Bandcamp Fridays every week. You know what I mean? Just like, I got to do something here. You know what I mean? Packages I forgot that I ordered. I'm still getting them. Hey, if um, Jacqueline's still asking this question two years into the pandemic, she's still talking about music, that means she's made it. Yeah. Like, yeah. she's scrappy. Yeah. Yeah. And Very she's true. figured it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, a few more months, she has got this. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, to some degree, Jacqueline, that's something we're all in on together, you know, from the people who, who serve uh, drinks at the venue to the fans to the to the promoters it's um it's brutal you know i mean i don't th i don't I, I think it does weigh the heaviest on the artists mm -hmm. and, and the folks who are trying to to get out there but it is it's a shared feeling it's tough um and uh, we're we're kind of uh, we're kind of wrapped up for questions which is totally cool um I'm, i just want to say thanks again to everyone out there who tuned in today who took the time to rsvp um, maybe you just saw the email today and you hopped on. Um, doesn't matter. We're going to make it available afterwards either way because uh, we obviously feel this is a really important conversation to have. Um, and again, um, just a huge thanks to uh, my panelists, uh, Amy, Chad, Mad, Tatum. Uh, huge shout out to uh, the guys at Toon Den Live here. But um, we thought it'd be fun to wrap things up with a performance since we have an artist on the panel, Mad Wellesley. Um, Mad and I connected actually last year in Nashville, um, but over the past year since we've met, we've noticed you know just sort of what Mad talks about a lot on her social platforms and how she advocates for this thing. So there is you know there's a little bit of an intention in, uh, behind our invite to, to Mad Wellesley to join us because um, it's not easy to talk about and we don't expect it. So for for someone to be sort of ready, willing, and able to talk about their own struggles and about what they go through um, and create. It's its really special. So at this time, I'd, uh, I'd love to kick it over to Mad. Just maybe talk a little bit about what the about what the song you're about to perform is and, and sort of what inspired it and yeah. play us off. We really yeah. appreciate it. So the song I'm going to play is called Working On Me. Um, it's basically a song that I wrote after starting therapy for the first time. And it's about my own process of accepting my imperfections, which is a lot of what we talked about today. <laughs> How are we doing back there? Okay. Just getting things set up. We're live. Started going to therapy, figuring out what's wrong with me Cause all these boys keep saying that I'm crazy I'm just trying to navigate, keep getting lost along the way Man, I'm confused, can you really blame me? Got all these thoughts in my head, words I never should have said When I get emotional, I kinda lose control Trying to find every little flaw, think about where I went wrong Cause I get emotional but I'm working on me Learning myself what I need Got me so free Falling apart perfectly Got a fear of missing out But when I'm there I'm freaking out So I'll just sip my wine and say I'm okay Sometimes I got an attitude Don't mean to take it out on you that I'm trying Got all these people in my head Words I never should have said When I get emotional I can lose control Trying to find every little flaw Thinking about where it went wrong Cause I get emotional yeah. But I'm working on me Learning myself What I need Got me so free
thoughts in my head when I get emotional, but I'm working on me, learning myself what I need, got me so free. Thank you guys, and thank you TuneCore. Bravo.